Hi folks, I am here today to finish the portion of example five in the longitudinal MLM class that I did not do in class because this takes the same models that we looked at in a multi-level modeling framework and estimates them using single level structural equation models in M plus and in R's package Levon instead. So the full results of everything that's in this handout are in the download packet for example five. And I just wanted to walk through the code as well as the interpretation and make the connections with the multi-level modeling notation into single level structural equation modeling notation as well. So the first step that we have to do, I am on page 15 of example five, by the way, the first step is to reshape the data because in multi-level models, there is only one column that contains all of the outcomes to be analyzed. And in SEM, it's a wide data structure instead in which one person is a row rather than an occasion and the occasions need to be stored in separate variables. So we have to go from long to wide in terms of how our data are structured. In M+, so that's the first uh, piece of code here, you can do that within the program using their long to wide option. So the sub options here for long tell it what the former columns were called. So I had a occasion index named wave and my outcome variable is a very uh, directly called outcome. I then tell it what I would like the new variables to be named in the wide file. So I'm taking what was wave and I'm turning it into time uh, zero to three. And then I am doing the same thing for outcome zero to three. So I'm adding suffixes basically that indicate which time occasion it is in the centered time metric, zero to three rather than one to four. I then tell it how the rows were organized into whose data go together. So person ID is my level two identifier, and then I tell it what the level one identifier used to be. Below that, the variable section then refers to what was in the original long data file. So it contained only three columns, ID for people, ID for occasion, and the outcome. The variables that I'm going to be analyzed then on the use variable statement come from the transformed data file. So again, names refers to the original long format. The transformed wide version names are on use variable. And as usual, I have a missing data identifier so that I don't have just blanks or dots. I am adding an option in M plus that is residual, which provides the model implied means, variances, covariances, and correlations so that those could mimic the uh, predictions from the model we would normally see in the R matrix, G matrix, and then their marginal combination back into V. So this is the common setup in M plus for all of the models. So I will just show from this point forward the model specific code. Now switching to uh, Levon. So in Levon, or in R rather, excuse me, prior to being able to use Levon, I need to use a reshape function to rearrange the data. So here's one where I'm going into a wide format. The original variable was called outcome. The ID variable was called person ID, and I'm using time as the time variable. So then it's going to rename outcome with dot zero, dot one, dot two, because those are the values that are here in time. So the names will be very similar, just with a dot in R that isn't there in M plus. So the first model is in this handout was saturated means unstructured variance, which is what's known as the H1 model in SEM terminology. And the idea here is that this is the right answer with respect to what the data want to be. All of the means are estimated separately, all the variances are estimated separately, and all the covariances are estimated separately. So to fit that model, uh, here is the M plus code first here. In M plus to refer to a variable's mean or intercept, you list the variable in brackets. To refer to a variable's variance or residual variance, you list the variable just by itself and note the semicolons at the end of these lines. By the way, the green is comments denoted with an exclamation point in M plus. And to list covariances is the keyword with, where if you list a series of variables on both sides of the width, that then tells it to estimate all possible covariances. So I'm asking for six covariances in one line here. 
Here is the corresponding Lavon code for the saturated means unstructured model, or what we would call the H1 model. In Lavon, it is uh, co comments, just as the rest of R, are with a either a pound sign or a hashtag, depending on how old you are. And then all of the model code is within this syntax object, which is why it's all green. But the non-commented parts are what, what are actually going to tell it how to set up the model. So in Levon, it's squiggle one to estimate a mean or an intercept, and to allow multiple commands on the same line, we have the semicolon in between them. So this first row is giving each outcome its own intercept. So each occasion is the context for these outcomes here, four different occasions. Then if you have squiggle squiggle, that is a variance or a residual variance. And then squiggle squiggle with a different word on each side is a covariance. Uh, I do not know of a way to uh, write all of the covariances more succinctly, so I just had to write them all out. Uh, so here are the six possible ones. Then we call um, Levon. Note that the estimator is ML. That is because there is no Remmel in structural equation models. So this is not a great choice for those of you who would have small level two sample sizes, but I'm demonstrating it in this uh, example as one of the points that I wanna make is we'll see how different the results turn out if we're using ML versus Remmel instead. So then asking to get all of the usual information that we would have, I don't need the standardized solution for our purposes here though. So this is Levon output. So we have the pairwise covariances among the six occasions. So this would be the off diagonal of the R matrix. We have the what's labeled as intercepts, although these are unconditional, so you could call them means as well. These, the, these would be in the solution for fixed effects. And then the variances, which would be on the diagonal of the R matrix. I then asked for the, the, these to be put together into matrices so that we could see them a little bit more easily. So this is the covariance matrix. So variances on the diagonal, the covariances are on the off diagonal. And because this is a saturated model where all possible things are estimated, this is the data. So this is not a prediction. It's, a, it's, it's a gonna be a perfect fit. And here are the means. Uh, I also then asked for the correlation version so that you could compare those. And then over here I have what it would have been using SAS mixed, where the difference is not the fact that it's a multi-level model, the difference is because it's using Remmel in the multi-level model. So just looking at, for instance, the first variance here, 2.267 at occasion zero instead of 2.36. So Remmel's variances are going to be larger then MLs, and the extent to which that is the case depends on how many people and how many parameters you have in your model. So there are only 25 subjects in this analysis, which is why we see a, a difference that's uh, visible. So conceptually, this is the H1 model in structural equation terms. This is our saturated means unstructured model in multi-level modeling terms, but it's the same deal. Uh, the second one I fit in this example was saturated means random intercept. So this is what I would do if you had unbalanced data or you had too many occasions relative to the number of people. So it simplifies the variant side. The purpose of this model would be to get a sense of what the average trajectory would look like. The saturated means part is why we would do this. So in this case, um, I am invoking latent factors to be able to uh, form a random intercept. So here's the M plus code here on the top. So I am defining a new latent factor. I'm calling it fact int. So intercept factor is what that means to me. The keyword by then asks it to tell us, or it wants to know rather, which outcomes are supposed to be measuring this factor and how. So I list all four of my outcomes. So the dash here is not a subtraction sign, it's an abbreviation. So when M plus sees this, it understands that I'm, it wants to have zero, one, two, three. And at in M plus is how you fix parameters to be known targeted values. So I am fixing all four factor loadings to be one, which creates this factor interpretation as an intercept. Because I am still estimating all of the separate intercepts for each occasion, 
I am fixing the factor mean to zero. So it's one or the other, not both. So the factor mean is being fixed to zero so that I can get the mean at each occasion instead. I am estimating the random intercept factor variance. So the variance of this new latent factor will be the variance that we would see in the G matrix for the random intercept. And I'm also constraining all of the occasion specific variances to be the same value. So by putting one word or one symbol in parentheses here as a label, but making that label apply to four different variances, I am forcing them to be the same number. So this is setting up an R matrix that has equal variances on the diagonal, and there are no covariances referenced in the code here. And I also, when I set up the model options in M+, I added this option model equals no covariances so that it would not add any that I did not want. Okay, so new latent factor, mean is zero for identification because I'm estimating the intercepts. The new latent factor, its variance is going to become the random intercept variance. And that means then the level one residual variance is uh, attached to the occasion specific outcomes. In Levon, same deal. I have fact int as my new latent factor, and that gets defined as equal squiggle. And just because rather than uh, have an at symbol for fixed parameters in Levon, it's a star. So it's actually the opposite of M plus. In, in M plus, a free parameter is a star, and in Levon, a fixed parameter is a star. So I am fixing the loading for the first occasion to be one and doing the same thing for all four of them. So that creates the definition of this factor as an intercept because of this common constraint loading. The factor mean I want to shut off, so I have squiggle zero to do that. I do want to have a factor variance, and so I have the factor squiggle squiggle with itself, and I'm adding a label here as well. Um, I tried to do that so that the output would match the same, but I realized I forgot to do it here, so I'm just gonna add one. It doesn't change anything. This is not a constraint, it's just a label but it helps to make your code a little bit more understandable for both yourself and anyone else that you might be sharing it with. So I have my intercept factor variance here. I am estimating the occasion specific means. So that's the saturated means part. And then I am constraining all of the four residual variances to be equal via this common res var uh, label. I don't know how to write this more succinctly but it is clear at least this way. So then we fit the model, ask for the output. And so here's the Levon output. The corresponding M plus output, by the way, is in the download folder for example five. So it's reminding us that we fixed all four factor loadings to one, which is why they don't have standard errors or test statistics. It's reminding us that our Intercept factor has a mean that we set to zero for identification, and we had to do that so that we could estimate these intercepts. So the dot in front means this is a conditional parameter. So these are intercepts rather than means. And the same is true of the variances. So here is my factor intercept variance. So int v, it's shortening the label that I gave it. And here are the residual variances, which I have forced to be equal. And so that's the value that it came up with. And out here as a comment, I have a note as to what it was in the corresponding Remmel solution as estimated using um, multi-level modeling software. Again, it's the difference in the estimator, not the software that's causing this difference. So 3.9 is the factor variance according to ML. It was 4.09 in Remmel, so a bigger estimate when you use residual maximum likelihood for these types of small samples. Not as much of a difference for the, the residual variance, though. It's really the random effect variances that are the problem. I then asked it to give me the model implied uh, variances, covariances, and means. So this would be the corresponding V matrix, or sigma, now that we're in SEM land. And so you can see that because we have a random intercept, 
it's a compound symmetry structure of equal total variance across time and equal covariance across time. Here are the means, and then here are the correlations. And this, this would be V-core in SAS terms. It provides us with the intraclass correlation that we observe after controlling for the occasion-specific means. So essentially after controlling for fixed effective time. So those were the descriptive baseline models. And now moving up from the simplest model and adding terms related to time. So model three is the empty means random intercept model, which would be shown with this kind of multi-level notation as we discussed in class, and which would be shown by this type of picture in SEM land. So we have the same setup for our factor because we're still just estimating a random intercept. However, to switch this to an empty means model, I am now going to estimate the factor mean. So I have given it a label of fixed int because this is going to become the fixed intercept. Because I have turned on the mean of the factor, I have to turn off the means of the individual outcomes. So the intercepts of the CFA equation have to be fixed to zero because I already have a fixed intercept here. So what we're saying is that we expect the same mean across every occasion. That's what empty means does. So again, this factor mean is replacing the occasion specific means for right now. And then we're still constraining the residual variances to be equal across time. Corresponding Levon code with the labels in there to help us figure out what's what. So the fact int factor is defined the same way. The intercept for the factor is now being estimated. And the factor variance is also being estimated. I'm sorry, I'm slowing down here looking at the labels here. Yep, that's okay. One doesn't mean fix it to one, it means estimate it. Not, not confusing at all. And then, of course, the four residual variances. Uh, I did shut off the occasion-specific intercepts with squiggle zero then. So squiggle doesn't mean fix it at zero. It mean, there, Squiggle zero means don't estimate it. So then here is our output. So we have the four-factor loading still constrained to one. Here is the mean of our latent factor intercept. So 12.8 is indeed the fixed intercept that we saw from the solution in SAS, R, and Stata. The factor variance is here. And again, this is a smaller number than what it was in REML because this is an ML estimate instead. And then here are the residual variances constrained equal. That creates then a predicted V matrix, or what we would call sigma in this context, that has this compound symmetry pattern. It predicts all four means are equal, because it's an empty means model. And here is the conditional intraclass correlation that would be found as V core. I did want to point out that this is a much smaller number, because this number does not yet control for mean differences over time. So it was much higher after controlling for mean differences than before. Now to add a fixed linear effect of time only, so just the fixed part, meaning that we are allowing some kind of change on average. It's constant change because it's a linear effect of time, but no individual differences just yet. So in the same way that we moved from one beta at level two to two betas, we now have two factors. So we have the same intercept factor as before, so all of the loadings fixed to one. But now we have a new factor, and we have defined it by having loadings at the first occasion fixed to zero, then one, then two, then three, as shown in the picture. So the loadings that are being fixed here are meant to convey a linear effect of time. So this would literally be the time predictor in a multi-level modeling data set that has a long structure. So this presupposes that you have balanced data. So I have a note here that if you have unbalanced data, you would need to specify the model differently using an option called t-scores. And I'd be happy to show you examples of that if anyone is interested. So now I have two factors. Each factor gets a mean. 
So these two parameters then are labeled as fixed int and fixed linear because that's what they're going to be. These are the fixed effects of the model. I still have my intercept variance. I do not yet have linear time slope variance though because this is a fixed effect only. So there's no u1 in the model yet. That's why this variance is fixed to zero. So it's being shut off as also noted in the picture over here. I'm still constraining all of the specific intercepts to be zero because all of the mean change is going to be handled by these two fixed effects instead. And I'm constraining the residual variances to be equal over time as well. Corresponding Levon code then, we have the intercept factor right here. Here is our brand new time slope factor with the loadings fixed. So zero star means fixed here, one star means fixed. I have my two factor means, one for the intercept, one for the fixed linear time slope. I have my intercept factor variance. I have my linear slope variance shut off at zero. My occasion specific intercepts still shut off at zero and my residual variance is constrained equal over time. I, from what I understand, there is there are functions in Levon, I think growth maybe is one of them, that simplify this code so that you have to type less. But when I teach, I don't use those shortcuts because I'm trying to be as transparent as possible about how the model is set up, what's being estimated, and what's not being estimated. So here are our results. So the intercept factor, I can call it that because of the way I've defined these loadings. Likewise, this has to be a linear time factor because of the way I've defined the loadings. If you wanted to create nonlinear uh, change over time or something like that, the loading pattern would have to be correspondingly different. So under intercepts then, our two factor means are the fixed effects. So the fixed intercept is the mean of the intercept factor. The fixed linear time slope is the mean of the linear time slope factor, and these values do exactly match what we got out of SAS. For the variances, we have our intercept factor variance, which again is underestimated relative to what it was in Remmel because this is a maximum likelihood solution. There is no factor variance for the linear time slope yet, and here's our constrained residual variance over time. Then asking for the model implied predictions, so what we would call V, which is sigma in this glass, is still compound symmetry because this model only has a random intercept in it. Here are the means implied by the fixed linear effect of time. So normally I would write estimate statements or use margins to get these model predicted means. You can do it this way in the context of SEM. And then here are the model implied correlations. So these would be in the V-core matrix. And again, this is the conditional intraclass correlation then after controlling for fixed linear time. Now we have the random linear model, which is where we, we ended up, I think almost, just a few more to go, but this is the big one. So we've picked up U1 here as a second way that people are allowed to differ from each other. So now people get their own linear time slopes. And this is the corresponding full picture that now has an estimated linear time slope variance as well as an estimated covariance with the intercept. So we've picked up this variance and this covariance as two new parameters. We have, all right, so here's the M plus code. The difference is right here. These are the two new terms that we've added. So we have the variance of the linear time slope factor now being estimated, and I've labeled it, as well as the covariance between the intercept and the linear time slope factor as our two new parameters in the G matrix. Corresponding Levon code then, the two new terms are right here. So we have linvar as our label for our factor, linear time slope factor variance, and then the covariance between the intercept and the linear time slope right here. Everything else is the same. So now we have listed first the covariance. So this would be in G. This is element 2, 1, the covariance between the intercept and the time slopes. Random effects from the same person. We still have our two fixed effects here. So this is the predicted outcome 
from the linear model at time zero is the 10.275. 1.7 is the rate of change according to the linear model on average. And we have our two factor variances here. So these would be our level two variances in the G matrix for the intercept and for the time slope. Again, both underestimated relative to what they were in Rimmel. Our constrained variance, this would be in the R matrix. And this is the residual variance constrained equal over time. So now we have a differently shaped marginal model implied matrix. Call it V, call it sigma, but don't call it compound symmetry because it's not anymore. The addition of the random linear time slope factor variance makes it so that the predicted variance changes as a function of which occasion it is squared. So variance over time is now predicted by a function of time squared and the model parameters. Likewise, covariance now depends on which two occasions it is and the model parameters as well. And I have a note for where you can find uh, the math worked out as to how this table got built. Because we're adding a random effect, more specifically, we're adding a variance of a random effect and its covariance with the intercept. We don't want to just stare at the p-value that goes with it. So this is sus, as my son would say, because variances don't have a normal sampling distribution the closer they get to zero, which is when this test would matter the most. So instead of staring at that walled test p-value, we will do the likelihood ratio test that we should do. So comparing the model that has the fixed linear term only to the model that also adds the random time slope variance and its covariance with the intercept. And this is the exact same significance test that we got out of uh, the multi-level modeling process. So we would conclude, yes, there is considerable evidence that we need the random time slope to make our model fit better. Last but not least, trying to introduce additional residual relationships in the R matrix, autoregressive and topolit slag one. So I tried and failed at this in R. So if someone knows how to do this in R, please let me know. I'd be happy to learn how to do it. But I do know how to do it in M+. So all of the code for the model up to this much is as it was before. The new piece that we need for M+, is right here. Sorry, my pages are off a little bit relative uh, to what your handout will probably look like, but the information is the same. So I have asked for pairwise covariances here. So P with means the first one of the series with the first one of this series, the second one of the series with the second one. So this is 0, 1, 2 is correlated with 1, 2, 3. So this is what I would call the lag 1 residual covariance. Likewise, 0 is correlated with 2, and 1 is correlated with 3. That's the lag 2 covariance. And then 0 and 3 are correlated as the lag 3. I can then define the new autocorrelation parameter and tell M plus how to use it to create these constrained covariances. So the residual covariance for occasions that are one unit in time apart, I want it to be built out of the ingredients from the AR1R matrix. So we have the autocorrelation to the first power times the square root of the two corresponding residual variances here, so the standard deviation metric. Likewise, correlations that are two units in time apart, or covariances rather, need to be built out of the autocorrelation squared times the corresponding standard deviations, and then lag three is built out of the autocorrelation to the third power. So this is taken straight out of the slides in terms of how the AR, uh, R-core matrix builds the corresponding covariances. Here are the M plus results for that. So I note the with statement here means this is a covariance. These are the estimated covariances among the residuals in the R matrix. So that's the model implied covariance that comes from the correlation plus the variances. Same with that one. We have our factor variances as before, constrained residual variance as before, and then the new additional parameter is right here. So the autocorrelation was estimated as 0.07. That value squared then creates lag two correlation and so on. And 
I think it's okay to look at this wall test because this technically could be unbounded, or you know, it's negative or positive, that is, it's bounded since it's a correlation, but it's on either side. Looks like it's pretty non-significant, and we do a likelihood ratio test would confirm that as well. Last but not least, uh, Topolitz lag one, I was able to get working in both of the packages. And so that one is done right here. So this is allowing a covariance for the residuals of occasions that are one unit in time apart. So zero with one, one with two, two with three, but it's the same covariance. And so it's a lag one covariance that is thought to hold for all of these relationships, all three of them. In Levon, I was able to do that with this line right here. So I'm estimating each pair of lag one relationships and I'm constraining them to be the same by the use of the same label. So here is the Levon output. Here is the new common covariance for residuals one unit in time apart. And covariances also can be positive and negative, so the wall test looks like this isn't going to help us, and indeed that's what we found earlier using multi-level models. Here is the model implied uh, V-matrix that results from that. And then we have our likelihood ratio test, where we have a comparison of the Topolitz model versus the random linear model, and yeah, pretty much the same conclusion. So I have a note here in terms of whether this is good enough. We would be able to test that using maximum likelihood relative to the saturated model, and we would get a bunch of indices for that, but not for unbalanced data. So the idea of using SEM because you can easily get tests of global fit does not work if you have unbalanced data in which there is no single right answer covariance matrix to come back to. So that is uh, one of the limitations. All right, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you on the other side.